So uh, we're incredibly thrilled to have Bernie Sue back with us this year. Bernie was a coach in last year's Broadband Accelerator, and we brought him back uh, this time to be a keynote speaker. Um, Bernie is a multi-talented and versatile writer, director, and interactive storyteller. He was a head writer and then executive producer of the wildly popular Primetime Emmy Awards interactive series called The Lizzie Bennet Diaries, as well as the writer and director of the Lookbook series, a scripted dramatic series for the popular fashion social network, lookbook.com. Currently, Bernie is the head writer and developer of Emma Approved, a series that spans across five platforms and was recently named the number two web series by Variety.com. He currently serves as the executive producer of Frankenstein MD, PBS's Digital Studio's first scripted series. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bernie Sue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to slightly organize here. All right. So um, thank you, Michael, for that thank you. warm intro. And thank you, everybody. So uh, my name is Bernie Sue, as he said. I am the co-founder of a company called Pemberley Digital. Uh, it is a studio in Santa Monica, California. And what we're known for is we take timeless stories, classic novels, and re reimagine them into interactive multi-platform shows. Um, we're most known for these three properties, Elizabeth Diaries, which is based on Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, Emma Approved, based on Jane Austen's Emma, and Frankenstein MD, based on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Now, I know there's a lot of writers and filmmakers in this room. As Michael alluded to, I'm an interactive storyteller. I started as a screenwriter uh, and moved on to producing and directing. And I like to think of the online platform, web video, online video as you call it, as an interactive space. So hopefully, when you see, after you see this, you'll be inspired to think differently in the way you tell your stories. So I'm going to walk through these three platforms, franchises really quickly, and then we'll get to the uh, conversation. So as Michael said, Liz Bennett Diaries won the 2013 Primetime Emmy Award for Original Interactive Media, Achievement in Interactive Media. It is the first and only Primetime Emmy for a YouTube series to date. It's the only one. Uh, YouTube, thank you. Now, to be fair, YouTube has several tech Emmys and daytime Emmys, but we're the only primetime one. Uh, we have 60 million views across YouTube. Uh, the show ended in 2013, but still does a million views a month, even though the show has been over for 18 months. 160 in-world videos across five YouTube channels. These are character YouTube channels uploading videos for the story. Nine and a half hours of total video content. It's the longest video adaptation of Pride and Prejudice in recorded history. We, have, we use 35 social media profiles. These are in-character profiles. These are the characters talking. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Pinterest, Instagram, LinkedIn, OkCupid, and many more. Uh, we have a novelization that just came out this year, published by Simon Schuster. Here it is, available at all major booksellers in both hardcover and softcover, thus making it a book based on the web series, based on the book. <laughs> First and only one. Uh, our audience, shouldn't surprise anybody who knows Jane Austen, 90% females, 10% males, and we skew young, it's YouTube, 70% females under 25. Let's go to the interactive. So when people talk about interactive media, they refer to it as transmedia sometimes, and that's building interactive opportunities for the user, the viewer. Now this is our philosophy. It's not saying right or wrong. This is just the way we think of it. We think of it as we do not punish the user who wants the lean back experience. Now what is that? The lean back experience is this experience we all grew up with. We sit on a couch, we click play, we lean back for two hours, in this case six hours of this playlist, and you get Pride and Prejudice on YouTube. You don't have to do a thing, you just enjoy the show. But we encourage the viewer who wants to lean in, click around, explore, interact, and we reward them with opportunities. With what? The chance to interact with iconic characters, talk to them, they may talk back. A chance to explore characters' uh, uh, platforms, revealing character and or plot. These are like things like Pinterest and Instagram and Facebook. And a chance to experience different characters' POVs over the course of one grand narrative, something that's never been done in any version of Pride and Prejudice yet. So how does this work? First step, simple, simple. You go to YouTube, you play a video. I'm sure everybody in this room has gone to YouTube and played a video. What happens is afterward, you get a choice. Uh, the, left, the right side there, you're right. Uh, in this case, you can go to the next or previous video based on where you're on the timeline. Next video, previous video. You can go to the next and previous video of the alternate character, top left, top right, those little icons up there. In this case, the character Lydia. Uh, again, based on where you're on the timeline. You can connect to the character's social media profiles. This is not the show, the character. YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook. And you can buy merchandise because why not? Moving on. I'm going to show you some examples of interactivity here. 
Um, and the first one is Twitter. So, Twitter is an interactive platform. All 13 characters in this show have in their individual Twitter accounts, they talk to each other. The left column there, these are two characters, Fitz and Gigi, they're talking to each other, having a conversation on Twitter, just like any people, young people that you know, or old people. Uh, in the middle there, a fan calls us out, Lizzie Marchese. She goes, I need photo proof that you two are together. She calls us out. Well, we have this photo ready to go of the two actors together. It is ready to go, and we feed it back into the feed from the two characters, thus bringing the fan into the show. My next example is in video. So in video, I'm going to set this up for you. Uh, let's go this way. So in video, we have a call to action where the character asks the user for questions. If you want any questions for me, as the character, not the actor, please ask them on Twitter and so forth. And she answers them. What we do with this is that we actually try to build in plot when we write the, write the line or the question in. Here's an example. Please play. For Escrit on Twitter, are there any guys in your life right now? That is a great question, Heather. So, Lizzie, are there any guys in your life right now? Um, not that I can think of, but if you happen to know any witty, handsome men swimming around, be sure to let them know I'm available. My spidey s- Okay, so you get it. The, the question brought the character into the scene. The, ca the audience's question did it. So, moving on. Another example of reactivity, we call this in the industry the rabbit hole experience. How this works is, at this point in the narrative, Lizzie is working at a company. A lot of people, a lot of the fans are interacting with her. They're going about it, and they want to know more about this company that she's working at. So we built a full experience for them, just these fans. At this point, number one, YouTube. Lizzie clicks, says, uh, if you want to know more about the company I'm working at, click at the link at the bottom of the screen here, or the description, and it will take you to the company. We track that link, 33,000 clicks across 100,000 views. That's a 33% click-through rate. Those of you who know click-through rates, that's insane. It goes to a website called Collins & Collins. It's the company's website. It's a fake company, but we built a website out. There's an experience for the fans. Um, on this website, it tells you what the company is. It's a DIY video company. They do how-to videos. And there's a call to action there. You can barely read it. I'm sorry. Collins & Collins seeks on-camera talent. We're asking the fans to submit. So the fans submit application videos, number three, collect videos, and we, we actually hire one, put them in, into the show, and like she's an, empl an employee of this fictional company in the narrative, thus bringing her in. And an example of expanding universe, there are a lot of examples, but this is my favorite one. Do you say the internet loves cats? We have a cat. Now, in Pride and Prejudice, there are five Bennett sisters, and that's a lot of sisters. So what we did to solve that casting problem, we made one of them a literal cat. We turned her into a cat. The character's name is Catherine, but it's short for Kitty, so Kitty Bennett, real cat. Lydia's cat, follow Kitty Bennett on Twitter. In the main channel, she goes, follow my cat on Twitter. She's really happy about this cat that follows her around all the time. Then she makes on her channel a literal cat video that moves the plot forward. It's a cat video that she narrates that moves the plot forward. And of course, the cat's on Twitter. It's got 15,000 Twitter followers. This is a fake cat. It's not even a real cat. And all its account does is just tweet pictures of itself looking cute, just like that. Moving on. <laughs> so, uh, in POV storytelling, I like to call this parallel storytelling. This is something that we do pretty well on our shows. And like I said before, if, uh, this is a 12-month timeline of the narrative. If you want Lizzie's timeline, you look at that top timeline, go to her YouTube channel, you get 12 months of Lizzie Bennett's story over the course of one year. And that's Pride and Prejudice. That's exactly what the book is. But many characters coming in and out of the narrative, her story. So, we actually give you opportunities to follow the characters across this whole timeline, when they're not on screen. How do we do that? Well, here we go. Lydia, for the first four months of the story, Lydia and Lizzie are living together. They are living in the same household. You can follow Lydia's story through her Twitter and her, Lizzie's YouTube channel. But month four, she, they separate. This is in the story, they separate. We actually fill in the gap. We said, we're gonna answer what Lydia's doing for that month. The book doesn't do that, but we're gonna tell you, and we give you a contained one month story. That's, that's not a punishment if you miss it. If you miss it, you're okay. But if you watch it, you'll get more of Lydia's story. And we do this for the entire narrative. You see there in month seven, she, comes, she, she leaves again, and in month 10, she leaves again. Thus, you actually have a complete 12-month narrative for this secondary character. The Gigi character doesn't come into the story until month 10. We didn't even cast her until 10 months into the show. But we give you 10 months of Twitter content. You can follow her Twitter account from day one and see what she's doing the entire 10 months in the narrative until she finally appears, before we spin her off again. So, what does this mean? It means you can experience the story in a variety of different ways. You can go down one timeline, the top one in this case, drop down, go down that one, drop down, go down the third one, or you can do what our super fans did, just took it all in 
in chronological order whenever it came because they love the story so much. So, uh, a lot of people ask about the business model. I don't know if you guys are interested, but, I'll, but I'll happily talk, I'll talk about it. How do you make money on this stuff? How do you make money online? Well, here's how we do it. Advertising. We have five business models. Six. Yeah, I actually had one, sorry. <laughs> Number one, advertising. Uh, you watch an ad on YouTube, you get a cut. Merchandising, posters, teacups, journals there. They do pretty well for us. Affiliate marketing, what this is, we'll talk about, more, talk about it more in the M experience, because we're really good at there. We're not really good at it, good at it in Lizzie. Uh, it means that when you uh, show a dress, she wears a dress, you link to the dress, Abercrombie or whatever, not really dresses, you buy it, we get a cut. Uh, we do VOD, you can buy the show, all our shows at iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon. Uh, we have repackaged them into DVDs. We didn't know if a DVD would sell for a show that's available for free online in perpetuity, but our fans wanted it, and so we said, well, we'll kickstart a DVD set. Uh, if they buy a thousand DVDs, we'll, we'll make a DVD set. It's a big box set. They blew us away and they ordered 6,000 DVDs at a $55 clip. We set the record for web series on Kickstarter at the time with $462,000 for uh, a Kickstarter making DVDs. Again, for a show that's available for free online in perpetuity. And of course, the novelization, as I can said, available at all major booksellers. Please check it out. <laughs> okay, the legacy. The legacy of a show like this. This, Elizabeth Bennet Diaries is arguably one of the most famous web, web series in the lexicon of the pop culture of our generation, and here's what I feel its, its legacy is. It's inspired thousands of fans to read Pride and Prejudice, many for the first time. It's been studied and analyzed in lecture halls and classrooms across the world, both as an interactive innovation piece and as an adaptation. We won an Emmy, and it's the definitive version of Pride and Prejudice for the connected generation, and here's proof. ABC News does a poll, famous actress by William Darcy, of Pride and Prejudice, our Darcy is beating Colin Firth by 3%. That's crazy. All right, I'm gonna move on to the Emma Approved series. Move. Emma Approved, starring Joanna Sodomura. Say hello, Joe. Hi. She's in the room. Now, <laughs> native Hawaiian. Um, to set this one up, I'm actually gonna play the video, and you guys will experience, see the video experience that summarizes the, the growth of what we've done here. So, let's see if this plays. Emma Woodhouse, beautiful, clever, and brilliant. Emma Approved is a modern adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma. Evolving and innovating from its predecessor, The Lizzie Bennet Diaries, Emma Approved presents a world that engages fans across five distinct but interconnected medias. Videos, photos, blog posts, music, and social media. I make your life better, and I never fail. Emma Woodhouse is a bold and audacious female entrepreneur who runs a matchmaking and lifestyle company while documenting her greatness for future achievements. She partners with her lifelong friend, Mr. Alex Knightley, who is sensible, sardonic, and the yin to her yang. Together with their eager assistant, Harriet Smith, the Emma Approved team strives to better the lives of their clients, sometimes without them even asking. I am all about the follow through. I see my clients from the temp job to the corner office, from the first date to the honeymoon. Twice a week, viewers can watch Emma and her team solve the problems of her clients, focusing on love, career, lifestyle, or happiness. There's no doubt that Emma has great style. And how cute is this top? Reflecting her chromatic eye and her penchant for looking her best, Emma keeps a fashion blog showcasing the full head-to-toe looks of her and her friends. This photo series gives an expanded look into the characters as their fashion evolves over their individual arcs, spotlighting exciting highs and dramatic lows. Over on the Emma Approved website, Emma keeps an advice and lifestyle blog running twice a week. This blog brings depth to the characters' voices and perspectives, as each post reflects events that are happening in the month's story. Maybe I can. On an alternate channel, Emma encourages Harriet to find her own voice by starting an online music club, where Harriet, in character, writes songs and shares them with fans. This interactive experience has already released four songs, and a call to action to fans has produced over 30 covers across six different instruments. Maybe I can. Maybe I can. Finally, story elements and character development are presented across various social media platforms. Fans can meet and talk to iconic characters, and the show can solicit fan input and invite engagement on multiple levels. These elements provide the connective tissue that makes the web video, photo series, advice blog, and Music Club one grand interactive story experience. And this uniquely dynamic world has also produced a dedicated fan community, which shares their theories, reactions, and anticipations together, showing how much they care about these iconic characters. 
In six short months, the Emma Approved Universe already encapsulates 56 videos, five hours of content, 150 blog posts, and four songs across five media platforms, making it one of the most expansive universes of any original interactive series to date. And there we go. Not bad, huh? Is that crazy or what? Wild. Man. <laughs> It's exhausting just looking at that thing again. Uh, notable, notable achievements of this show, uh, Variety is number two web series in 2013. Uh, we really built a different platform into this. We built an integration so that we could make money on the show just as an ROI. Because a lot of people go, well, what are you doing all this stuff? How does it monetize? So we built some integrations in, which I'll kind of walk through really quickly, just so you have to get some ideas. And we monetize every platform. All five of those platforms you saw, we generate income of all five. They may not, some are more significant than others, but we built, we designed this series to do that specifically so that we could do the cool stuff. Audience uh, evolution, 93% female, so you can see there's a plus 3% gain on the female side from Lizzie to Emma. Those of you who know statistics know that gaining 3% on a statistic like male-female split on the plus 90 side, it's kind of crazy. Uh, and we're a little older now too, 56% females are under 25, double digit gains in the 18 plus demo. Good for advertisers, just so you know. Right, as I said before, or in the video said, the five media series. This is the greatest innovation of this show. It is a five platform series, truly five. Video driving the other four and all working together and separately so that it's not punishing. If you only watch the videos, you're good. You get Emma as a book on the show. But if you want to see more, you can go to all five, four of these other ones and see a grander experience. Again, by themselves or all together. Well, and they're all interactive. <laughs> and how this works in the parallel, story, parallel storytelling universe, there you see it. Five different platforms running for 12 months. There are the actual numbers. That video you saw was a little old. 72 videos, 14 bonus videos, 135 fashion looks, 90 advice blogs, running twice a week, 60, six songs with 50 plus fan covers, and social media, because we're good at that. We keep doing it. All right, so now to show you the evolution of the interactivity a little bit. Now we have three platforms to throw interactivity on. When, you, when someone asks us a question, in this case, Nightly says, ask me questions, and I'll answer them. Well, she, he can answer them in three different places. He can answer them in the video series, just the same way we did Lizzie, same thing as you just saw. She, he can answer them in social media, because that's normal. Someone tweets at me, I tweet them back. And he can answer them on his weekly column about business advice, if it's a business question. And the music experience, as you saw in the video, how do you make music interactive? Well, we did it, here's a way. Not the only way, but here's a way. Harriet writes a song about what she's going through. She shares it on social media. She just gives it away, it's free. You can download it, the uh, compilation on, uh, done by her. And then they, she encourages you to cover it. Fan, those of you who know music know that the compilation is written in for ukulele, but uh, you see a guitar there. So they had to figure out what the arrangement was to translate it into guitar, piano, and all these other things. Xylophone, whatever that was. Um, and of course, when, she, when the fans show Harriet her cover, she encourages them and promotes them on her Twitter. So you get promotion. How do we use all five of these platforms to tell one story? That's a question I get asked a lot. Here's an example of how we use all five across one 10-day arc. Now, this is getting it's across 10 real-time days. Episode 38, this is the benefit, the eco-friendly benefit arc. That was 338. Emma and Frank come together and we're like, we're gonna do a benefit. What's the benefit? It's gonna be an eco-friendly event. Well, on social, Emma starts her, on her Pinterest board, which has been going the whole show. She starts a Pinterest board for this specific event. Then she writes an advice column about it. How do you plan a, such an event? That's a, that's a strange thing. There's things to worry about. Next episode, 39, that's three days later. We finalize the plans. It's gonna be great, it's gonna be exciting. Social media, the next day, the night of the event, we actually show you a, a photo blog, a photo blog, a photo series, just like any documentary, documentary of any event, like the event was real. And it only exists on her Facebook. Then episode 40, the day after, the event was great, good job everybody. They show off their fashion looks, they look great, and the music at the end of the arc to punctuate the uh, arc for the character. Five medias, 10 days. Okay, evolutions in the integration area. We talk about the money, we talk about the ROI, we talk about the integrations. So, here's our, here's our philosophy, relating back to our transmedia philosophy. Storytelling comes first. Our integrations are passive, they are non-invasive. We, nev we never call out a product, we never call out a brand. 
We never call it a link. We never say, go here to buy this. But we show the use of the product and highlight it in video and in social. Make it a part of the story make it, and make it easy for the user to find out more about the product. So if a user clicks through, it's their idea. We're not forcing them, we're not telling them, it just, we're inspiring curiosity. So how does that work? Clothing integration. This is how a clothing integration works. On the left there, Em and Harriet are going, episode three, they're going through their narrative. They're going through their narrative. They're not talking about clothes, they're not talking about how cute their, each other's clothes are, they're going through their story. But you may go, whoa, those are two cute outfits. I wanna know more about those outfits. We'll make it easy for you. Bottom of the page, in the description, Harriet's top, Emma's look, two links that we track. Where does Harriet's top go? It goes in mod cloth, 40 bucks, pick a size, good to go. Where does Emma's look go? It goes to her fashion blog, her full her website. There you actually get more content. You actually see the full head to toe look of the entire inspiration of what she's wearing. You get to see the shoes, you get to see the clutch. It's all there. You don't see it in the series, you see it only in the fashion blog. And she writes about why she wears these things and what they make her feel. And in this case, all, all looks, all items are available at Nordstrom's. Again, we link, we link to them, make it easy for you to go get if you want to. If you don't, that's okay. Keep watching the show. And of course, Samsung. This is our, one of our biggest integrations. In December last year, um, I actually did this call, I closed this deal here, by the way, all right? I did the call here, all right? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I left the, <laughs> whatever. I'll tell you about later. Um, Anyway, so uh, Samsung came to us and said, like, we want to show off our watch, our watch coming out that, uh, that just came out, and we want to market it or show it off to young uh, tech-savvy females. I'm like, well, that's our audience. We're 93% female. So um, they want to integrate in, and they said, we don't want you to make it gratuitous. We want to make it part of the narrative. So what did we do? Well, we just showed it off. The watch takes photos. OK, let's make a photo taking part of the narrative. These two characters are meeting for the first time. They are struggling about to find topics to talk about. This guy goes, well, my, wa like, my watch takes photos, takes a photo of her. Now the key thing is, is where does that photo go? It's not in the video, because that doesn't make any sense. It goes on Instagram. It goes, to, it goes to the character's Instagram, because that's the most natural place for that photo to go. Well, we've already built that, built that platform to exist. It's not a reach for us. We've already been sending photos to Instagram. For in this case, the photo from this scene appears on Instagram, and it's tagged properly. In video, well, the watch took video, so we were like, we gotta show that off too. So in this case, we did the same thing, similar, but a little different. Harriet writes a, play, plays a song for, well, let me rephrase this. Emma writes a song for Harriet. Harriet plays a song for the Elton character. Elton records it on his watch and beams it to Emma's phone there. And of course, where does that video go? Well, we're a video series, it should go on video, right? No, it doesn't. It actually goes on Instagram, again, because that's the most natural place for Emma to put that video on her Instagram. And again, we tag it accordingly. Of course, uh, on the other two platforms, on the, on the advice column, well, every blogger I know does a holiday gift guide. So Emma should do a holiday gift guide. And what's the most natural thing to put on that gift guide? This watch and phone. Now, you may think of it's, it's a bit of a sellout. It actually isn't. The, iron, the irony here is that because she's a fake person, she's not real, the most authentic thing in this gift guide is the watch and the phone because it's actually in her show. So. The most authentic piece of this gift guide is the piece that's integrated into the show. I think it's pretty funny. And of course, before the watch was a cool tech device, it was a fashion accessory. Well, we have a fashion series, so we naturally use the watch as an accessory uh, with a couple of head to toe looks. There's one you see there. So what does this mean? It means that this integration was a pure five media integration. First of its kind, I believe. It was integrated part of the video series, the fashion blog, the advice column, the social media experience, and the music club as a true five media experience. Okay, and finally, yes, are you tired yet? But finally, the last franchise that we're talking about, Frankenstein MD. Now, the big thing about this show in the pitch is that we gender swapped Dr. Frankenstein. We made he a she. Dr. Frankenstein, Dr. Victor Frankenstein is now Victoria Frankenstein, there on the left. So, uh, we did this for PBS Digital Studios. These are these social platforms again. It's basically the same thing like the M experience. We're really good at it now. We can just port it into other shows using blogs and, uh, and, and social media to tell a narrative. In this case, this is the arc where they've already resurrected the creature. It's out and about and they're trying to find it. And so they're hunting it down. You can see across different things where they're going out at night and looking for it and so forth across the narrative. But you probably want to know more, more about the achievements. Here it is. As Michael said, it is PBS Digital Studios' first narrative scripted series. Now, I'm going to clarify, digital, not the main channel, digital. 
this, it's presented as a science series. So it's, this is like not quite a vlog series, it's a science series. So weekly there's science experiments all pieced together to, about, to be about resurrection. So bone grafting, skin grafting, and synthetic blood. These are all individual episodes that we did for this show. 36 videos aired across 12 weeks. We had a Halloween finale, of course, it's Frankenstein. Why wouldn't we do that? We expanded the social story again, blog, Instagram, Twitter, Tumblr, but we contained it. Just again, it's, it's a science series. It's not a fashion series like Emma is, it's a science series. And our audience, 65% female, 35% male, on PBS's channel. The key thing is it's a channel. So, the day before we launched, their channel was 20% female, 80% male. We literally overnight turned them into a female dominant channel because we had their show debut there. So, finally, what does this mean for this company? In three years, we've done three franchises reimagined. Lizzie Bennett Diaries, Emma Approved, Frankenstein MD, across multiple platforms. My name is Bernie Sue, executive producer and showrunner. That's Michael, hi there. <laughs> Say hi to Joanna afterward. And that was my presentation, thank you. Have a seat. Sure. So, crazy. That's all, that's all I'll say. Not bad, right? Not bad at all. Not bad <laughs> at all. So, um, I want to, there are a ton of questions I want to ask about the production component, the staff, and, and, but I really want to start with you as an individual. Tell us a little bit about your background. What do you think prepared you to eventually do what you did? Because it's the first of its kind, and there are no programs out there that say this is how you do this kind of stuff. And what, when you look back at your career, what, what were the moments that really you thought prepared you or informed you to be able to do this? Um, well, my background is very diverse, actually. So in college, I studied uh, mass media communications. And I knew I wanted to be in entertainment in the, in the industry. I just didn't know where. I didn't know if I wanted to be a writer or a director. I liked those, those things. I just didn't know what I wanted to focus on. So when I graduated, I actually went back to where I grew up, which was Silicon Valley, and I had a tech background. My dad shoved the computer in me, at me when I was like 12, so mm -hmm. I've always had that. He's always wanted me to be an engineer up until the day I won an Emmy. So <laughs> that's when he changed. <laughs> so he's like, all right, you're, you're okay now. You don't have to be an engineer anymore. Um, but, uh, um, so I had a tech background as well. And then uh, when I moved to Hollywood, YouTube didn't exist yet. I was studying screenwriting. I was studying, I wanted to be a television writer specifically. Television was my, my thing. And um, as I was studying television, writing specs, learning, taking classes, writing pilots, YouTube rose and I kind of observed it and I'm like, this is where it's gonna go, where something's gonna go here. It's, mm. It may not all go here, but it's gonna go, keep growing. So I, gotta be, I better keep a, an eye on this. And of course, my tech background. Well, that's, that's a, a good thing to play in. Um, so an advantage and I kind of evolved and you, Getting into television hasn't changed in 15 years. Yeah, yeah. It's the same system. Yeah. So with web being kind of amalgamous and, and like, like morphing as we go, it was fun to just like, all right, I can go in this way, I can go in this way, I can construct this way, and then, um, and so forth. So I went, I went in that way. And then the third thing, actually, my, my survival job in, in, in LA was in advertising. Mm. I didn't want to be in tech. I didn't want to do like, an editing job, so right. I was in advertising, and that helped online too. So I, I was able to think about the the monetization. The monetization. Yeah, so that's monetization. where that came in. Got if it. You're got it got that, got all it. that that thinking comes in. Got it. So you came up with this idea. Um, was it a conscious choice to go after a, an existing book that had obviously a certain level of penetration when it came to the marketplace? Of you know, how conscious were you to actually make the choices that you did? Was it something that? You specifically said, you know what, I want to go after a book with a large marketplace that a lot of young women have read and I'm going to reinvent it. How did you stumble upon it? Was it, you know, tell us a little bit about that process. Well, I have to give credit to my, my co-founder, Hank Green, who, who decided, who picked the book. And it, was, mm -hmm. it was clearly the right book to, to pick. Um, that book is arguably the most beloved novel, classic novel ever. Um, I don't know of any other piece of literature that's a book that has that much fandom out mm. there, people who love it so much. Now, I think the people who haven't, haven't read Pride and Prejudice, but the people who, who have, they love it. Right. They love that story. So aside from that, maybe you can think of, say, Romeo and Juliet, yeah, right. which is a play, right. and then maybe you can say the religious books, right. like the Bible, but right. we weren't gonna do the Bible. Right. So, uh, <laughs> um, and love for other reasons, right? right. Uh, so that's why we picked that. At the time, 
the marketplace online was very heavily toward male gamer. Right. So we figured we were going for an untapped market. It's, it's shifted now. A lot of, there's a lot of women's content down there now, which is, that's yeah, good. Um, but uh, that's, that was our strategy. Got it. So in, when you look at the production of this, obviously there is the writing, there is the producing, there is the multi-platform content that you're looking to distribute. How long does it take you to basically plan out the actual execution of the content from you know, the actual video content to the blogs to the pictures to the actual interactive accounts that you set up that are based on the characters themselves? And when, how do you aggregate an audience to make sure that the minute you launch this that you can actually tap into that audience to start watching the show? Um, well, is it, oh, there's, there's two parts of your question. Yeah. So the first part is about the, no, whatever, you don't need it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the, fir the first part is about uh, how we design it. Right. So we design it, I, our shows are the only shows, script and narrative shows, script and narrative serialized shows on, on the web that I know of that are done like a television show, which means that we are writing, we are shooting, and we are editing, and we're releasing all at the same time. So we think of them as months. Mm -hmm. Like, so if we are in month three of release, we're releasing month three of content, it means that we are shooting month four at the same time, we're writing month five at the same time, and wow. so forth. So it's like a rolling production right, the whole right. time. We do this because we, are, we can be as close to the audience as possible. We, if we see them react to month three, and we want to shift something, we can adjust it mm -hmm. by month five. Right. So it, it feels like the audience is more part of the story. Those Q and A's, you know, we shoot them in advance. We have to write them. Right. But we have to get the questions in. We have to write them. We have to shoot them. So you think about like you you can only do that in a rolling production. Um, so there's that. Uh, the other thing is that the videos to us are, are go first. So the video series, we're a show. That's the most important thing. That's the A line. Again, we want to make we want to make it the non punishing experience. So to us, if, if this line, the video line, relied on everything else to make it make sense, you are essentially punishing anybody who doesn't go down. Right. That's not our philosophy. So we make sure the videos are good, they stand alone, they're a good story with great characters and great performances and all that stuff, and you know, I think we're pretty good at it. Um, when we finish that, when we actually lock, when we, get, we finish shooting it that, that month, that's when we really go down and, and break apart what we need to do interactively. Now, we do that with the script, of course, because sometimes she'll mention like a tweet in the script, and like, oh, we better get that. <laughs> like, right, right. And like, so, some prop will come into the show, like we, there was this thing with jams, we made sure to get, get Instagram photos of the jams, just to have them ready, so that month, uh, three weeks later when that episode would air, we'd have that photo ready to go. It's, it's simple, just planning. Got it, got it. But the interactive team went second, um, always. But the interactive team built, uh, went with the show as it went. Now at the beginning, of course, it's different. At the beginning, you have to construct everything. So for Emma, we constructed everything in the beginning, where we, it's like, all right, we're gonna have a fashion blog. We're gonna have an advice column. We got to build those from the beginning. And, and, they're, and they're probably not gonna be very good at the beginning, and they aren't. They're not, like, I'll, I won't lie. Uh, they're not great experiences. But as we got, went through the show, it's almost like as Emma got better at it, we got better at it as well. So those advice columns are functional. Like, you will get life okay. advice <laughs> from a fake character, <laughs> and, your life will hopefully be better for it. <laughs> and you probably dress better too. <laughs> and so obviously one of the biggest things that most advertisers and producers look for is building an audience online. Right? Sure. Um, you know, we see videos that go viral and garner 10 million views. We also see videos that people produce, pour a ton of money and get 16 views, right? So not, you know, so what's been your process in being able to aggregate an audience to make sure that people that people end up watching the shows that you produce? How do you go about that process? Well, we, we are against a lot of normal, traditional ways of advertising thinking. Number one, it's a uh, promotion. Okay? Mm -hmm. Not saying we're not against promotion, but we, there's a lot of promotion about like, oh, we got, you have to do a video about something timely. Mm. Um, Taylor Swift is hot right now. You should do Taylor Swift stuff. You're gonna right. get tons of views. It's probably true, actually. If you release some Taylor Swift parody right, right. now, you'll get some views. Yeah. Um, you may not get that, those views a year from now. Mm -hmm. Who knows what happened with Taylor Swift a year from now? You can't, right. you can't rely on that. So all of our shows are designed to be kind of what I like to describe as um, we don't cover anything popular culture. Mm -hmm. Lizzie Bennett Diaries ran in 2012. That was, the, it was right in the middle of the election. It was right in the middle of the Wall Street, 99%, 1%, that whole thing. We don't mention that at all. Mm -hmm. Not a thing. You know, we don't talk about the Olympics. We don't talk about anything that, that dates it at all, mainly because we want the experience now. Those one million people, or whatever, one million views that we get every month, 
They're getting good experience. They're not being, oh yeah, that's what happened in 2012 in their mind. We just punt that stuff. We don't want it. So for us, it was, well, for me specifically, maybe some of my coworkers or the execs or whatever worry about the views the next day. And sure, like if they're terrible, then I'll, I'll worry about them too. I'm not so worried about that. I'm more worried about the views in the long tail. Got it. I, I'm, I'm more happy with you know, Emma's being over now and it still does half a million views a month or whatever mm -hmm. it does right now. I think that, that's awesome. Right, right, right. And we're right. not doing anything. Got it. <laughs> you know, these people just love the show. Yeah. So for you, one, obviously the big thing for you is to make sure that the content is evergreen. So it lives in its own world. It's not infused by what's going on in the world and people can consistently access it and feel like they're delving into something powerful and rich that they can experience. As best you can. I mean, yeah. we're, we're taking, we're, our business is adapting evergreen stories. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why they're 200 years old and we're still reading them in schools and they're being republished and made into snap mashup with zombies and stuff. <laughs> like, there's a reason for that. So right. they're evergreen. So why are we gonna mess with that? Yeah. We shouldn't mess with that at all. Um, again, our philosophy, you, anybody in this room can go make Pride and Prejudice right now on YouTube and make it topical. Right. And it may do better, who knows? Yeah, 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 totally got it. So tell us a little bit about your process on working with um, uh, Frankenstein MD. Obviously that was a, you know, PBS Digital took a risk. This was something completely new. You shifted the audience of the demographic of what they typically were used to. Um, did they come to you with the idea? Did you go and pitch them the idea? How did that uh, relationship start? It, the relationship started because they, they saw what we were doing. Mm. Education, of course, mm -hmm. is a big thing for them. And they're like, we want to work with you guys. You guys are thinking outside the box, um, multi-layered, made for the internet type thing. What do you want to do? And I said, Frankenstein. Mm. And you're like, oh, what's your take on it? It's like, Frankenstein's a medical doctor. I'm like, great. And that was it. Wow. Like, it was, it was pretty much a, a, there's this thing called VidCon. It's a convention in Anaheim every year. And people talk about you know, the fandom, the fans that go, and it's all crazy, like, like the next Comic-Con type thing. Um, I like to think of it as like, like it's a place to get like a lot of talks done because mm -hmm. it was in the lobby of, of, of VidCon where we had that meeting just like over soda and it was like, and they're like, yeah, it's great. Uh, do you have a deck? I'm like, I'll get it to you in a couple weeks and mm -hmm. it, was it was done. Off the races, yeah. Unbelievable. So what advice would you give traditional writers and producers, people who are currently working in television or in motion pictures? What sort of lessons that you've taken away from the work that you've done that could potentially help them with their career, with their writing, or inform them with what they're looking to do into the future? Um, I like to think of it as, um, I'm not gonna tell you any writer in this room who's a screenwriter who wants to be a screenwriter for features that you have to do interactive. I think that's, some of my colleagues will say that. I don't, you do what you wanna do. I again just wanted to inspire a different way of thinking for what I do, just to get you to think differently. Uh, and I encourage you to do that. I think there's ways to do everything correctly. I am not afraid of brands. I am not afraid of like, working for other companies and stuff like that. I just want to make sure that's authentic to the story. And that's what I'll tell them. It's like, I don't want to work with brands if they, if, if they want to turn everything commercial. I do want to work with them if they want to try something cool and, and do something outside the box. And whether that be Things like uh, Prometheus had that like TED video, right, right, right. video. Like that's right. that was neat. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, can't, I can't say that that video led to more people buying tickets, right? right? But cool, great. You like the integration? I like it felt the, authentic. It felt authentic. Yeah. It's like yes, this Whalen character would have a TED talk in whatever year it was about space travel and everything. Right, right, right. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, I, I like those type of things. Um, they're not all great. Uh, I also, and I also would say that. You know, if, if, you, if you really liked or inspired what, what you just saw and want to do stuff, my advice to you with related to that would be, we'll stick to what you're good at story-wise first. Make sure that screenplay is great because that's, if that movie isn't good or that TV show or that video series isn't good, the rest of the other layers don't matter. No one's gonna go down. Got it. No one's gonna go down. Cool, well, let's open it up to some questions. Let's go. Yes, back there. Production team. On the interactive team? So the interactive team for Frankenstein, that's the recent one. Um, there are one, two, three, four, I'll call it five, four to five. They're not all full time and they're not all only on interactive. Um, there's one person who's in charge of the interactive experience as, as an overseer and she'll write some of the blog posts and she'll do like lead the interactive meetings, but it's the associate producer and the producer and the social media person that have to kind of come together who are doing the other parts of the show and contribute to the top line. 
Um, so it, it, like any other in, uh, indie kind of work, it's like you, everybody wears lots of hats. And that's the type of people I like. I like versatility. So and just to be clear, so that's the interactive team. Is that separate from the produ video production team? No, the producer. Uh, so it's who, who, across who, who, the board. Who's, who's, yeah, it's across the board. Got the it. producer, associate producer, um, and social media person who are on the interactive team, who Frankenstein, they all work on the production as well. Like they're it. there when we're, when we're shooting. Uh, the interactive producer, we, 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 we give her a co-producer title, a co-producer title, because she's producing story content, content a right. lot of it, right? She doesn't have to be on set. We welcome her to be on set. You can come hang out, but really, she doesn't need to do anything right. because she just tells us what she she needs. She needs to like, document the the specimens and the experiments, and and talk to the science guy and make sure the science guy tells you how exactly this works. Like, what the hell's a chromatograph? You know, like, right, like right, right. those type of things. So yeah. yeah. Cool. Yes, Brian. How did you get that initial when you first did this event? How did you get that initial traction to get the views and people even know that it existed? How do you get the initial views? So. Uh, this also relates to um, a thing I think is flawed about modern marketing uh, with content, which is you worry about the initial views. Okay, but I'll tell you how we did though. <laughs> so um, the initial views, I, uh, my partner in this was a guy named Hank Green, who's a big YouTuber. He, his brother is John Green, who wrote The Fault in Our Stars. He's got a big audience. So I would say that when that first episode launched, a good he sent a good, unique, ten thousand unique eyes eyeballs to that show. Ten thousand sounds big. Across 50 million, no, it's not that big. So uh, that's not what the success came from. To me, it didn't matter. It didn't matter if he sent those eyeballs over or not because it mattered if we executed Pride and Prejudice. We are redoing the most famous book in history. So as long as we executed that, we'd be good. Anybody in this room is a big Pride and Prejudice fan. If I pitched you the concept, Pride and Prejudice as a video blog series, you may think that's the worst idea ever as a Pride and Prejudice fan, blasphemous but you're gonna check it out. Thus, it's up to us to execute at a high level to make sure you stay for 100 videos. Did, did, I mean, there must have been some risk involved, though, like whether or not did you feel like, oh, what if this doesn't go after like four weeks or six weeks? Yeah, sure. Um, we, we deficit finance ourselves, like out of our own, own pocket. We made sure to make enough content for 12 weeks. And if you're asking for a recommendation of how much content to make for web series, it's 12 weeks, <laughs> all right? I'm just telling you now, so you, you don't have to ask me later. Um, because we figured after 12 weeks of content, airing it all, putting it all out there, letting the audience find it, letting the audience grow, we would know if we had a hit or not. And we did. Got it. Yes? Um, this is such a nascent paradigm, right? I'm just curious what's your sense or what's your projection uh, 10 years from now, your audience base are all teenagers. Do you, do you think that this user behavior is going to move forward so that the 10 years, 25 year olds, they won't necessarily be into Emma or Lizzie, but do you think the behavior, the user behavior, is projected or do you sense it will move forward into more mature content? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll give you, I'll give you some things that may, may, or not, may or may not blow your mind about society. Anybody under the age of 25, our audience, okay, under 25, doesn't know a world without internet. It never existed to them. They have had internet the entire life. That means in high school they had Wikipedia. They, you know, like that's what they have. Okay. Number two, anybody under the age of 10 will never know a world without a touch screen, tablet, iPhone device. It doesn't exist to them. So all those kids, when they grow up, they're going to expect to touch their video. They're going to expect it. They're doing it now, right? Those of you who have kids with iPads, you see them. They go up to a TV and they start touching it. And they go like, well, why doesn't it move? So those are, that's user behavior. So if, you, if you're thinking about career longevity of what you're going to create or write 10 years from now, well, that's the main audience, right? That, that, that teen to 30 block. Think about what their, their habits are going to be. You can't predict it for sure, but we know some signs. The, iPad, the iPhone is probably the biggest game-changing Invention of our lifetimes. Got it. Well, how, how much fun is it to work with uh, Steven Zaragoza? He's hilarious. Steve Zaragoza plays Igor, the, our Igor character in Frankenstein. He is so funny, and he actually won the part outright, by the way. It's, like, it's not like, oh, we, we, we have an internet comedian star, we're going to just cast him and get the views that he's going to bring. We did cast him, we got the views he was going to bring, but we cast him because he was the best person for the part. Freaking hilarious, I almost swore there. <laughs> so, hilarious. Yes? Do you take outside projects? Do I take outside projects? What does that mean? What's it? What meaning? 
Meaning, it's like outside of the bat company. No, not your own projects. Oh, else. yeah, yeah, we, we take pitches. Frankenstein came as a pitch. I didn't, I was not the originator of like, oh, we should adapt Frankenstein. Someone came to me and said, I like to pitch you Frankenstein. What's your take? Okay, I'm gonna rework it a little bit and then blah. So there's a process. No, no, no. Well, they pitched it to me. We acquired a Frankenstein option from them and made it ours so that our company, Pemberley, would have a Frankenstein. It's gonna be that one. Um, we look at that for all the classic novels. And then uh, we were technically hired out to, be, to do PBS's show, because it's on their channel, it's not on our channel, but we actually still own the IP, so it's like our show on their channel, it's a license fee. And then myself as a creator will do stuff outside of this company. I'm only just showing you this Portion company, it, because it's doing. cool. <laughs> <laughs> Georgia? Well, this is awesome. First of all, thank you for highlighting They could definitely be from Hawaii. The trickiest thing would be the time zone difference. Mm. Yeah. But uh, we, we do a lot of Google Hangouts. Um, there are many times where uh, the, the, the interactive lead will, will she, has a, she, she is a kid, so sometimes she has to Google Hangout in instead of driving across town. And that's fine. We get it done. Cool. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Christian. What's the sweet spot for episode length? Like, how long is too long? On, on uh, that's a good question. I really, uh, I really don't know. I always like to say it's, it should be as short as possible, but as long as it needs to be, um, <laughs> which can be anything. Our episodes range from four to ten. I, I think, but look, like people web, like I go on Netflix and I'll watch an, an, an hour and a half documentary, yeah. and it's like I'm watching something on the web. So it really has just good content. Um, we design our shows, the reason why we design our shows to be short like that is like we want them to be bite-sized, we want lots of videos because that means more ads, um, and also we can space them out to make, make it feel like there's like a huge journey, a year-long journey of 100 videos, even though it's, that's like a mini-series length. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons we do it, but there are episodes of Lizzie Band Diaries that are nine minutes long. We could have cut them into two, but it just felt like a weird experience to just chop it in the middle of, a, uh, of an episode. Um, but relating to that, though, a lot of people go and they go in the web series, they go, oh, I have a, I have a screenplay, it's 120 pages, I'm gonna just chop it up, I'm gonna shoot it as, it as is and chop it up into 30 or 10 pieces and it's gonna be a great web series. No, that doesn't work because you end up with like episodes that are like one scene or two scenes that have like no context with them. If someone comes in and watches that episode, they're gonna be completely lost. While when someone comes into like episode 40 of Emma, they may not be caught up, but they're gonna have a good experience. They're, they're, gonna, they're gonna laugh, they're gonna get a complete narrative, at least in that, that, that theme of the episode. So we have to, you have to design the experience to be for web um, and the, the amount of minutes you do. Uh, and you see a lot of people writing notes, so you can note this too. Um, I did an assignment two years ago which was a feature web series. And what that meant was that it's 120 pages, it's like 110 pages, screenplay, um, paid like a screenplay, which is great, <laughs> and they said that we want it to be episodic on the web. And I'm like, how many episodes? And he's like, well, at least 10. Give us at least 10. And I looked at the narrative and I built it out. And I was like, let me give you 14. Is that okay? And they're like, well, look, can, can you read it? Wrote him out. If you look at that screenplay now, it's a 110 page screenplay and it's got 13, tw yeah, yeah. through the end, 13 really good cliffhangers to get you to the next part. And, and if those of you who know structure, you can find them already. There's, there's these things called act breaks in screenplays, right? Act one, act two, act two A, yeah, act two B, yeah, yeah. act three. Yeah. Well, there's three breaks right there. Now you just gotta build in some more, more breaks. Cool. Yes. Hey, with Lizzie Bench, the Lizzie series now, do you still have people working full time on that? Um, well, we have people who work at the company full time. Lizzie, as a franchise, still lives on. Um, obviously, we're tracking the book sales for this. There's a second book, that's, that's, it was a two book deal. There's a second book in the, in the franchise that comes out uh, next summer. Um, it's, it's actually a sequel. It's actually following the Lydia character uh, post this story. So we're actively working with that. Um, but the people who work at the company work on all the shows that are active right now. So they just finished Frankenstein. Still kind of working on it actually. And um, Emma's still alive. We just released some behind the scenes content literally today. Uh, 
which we were talking about with dinner. But, uh, yeah, but yeah. Since the series is complete, do you have binge watchers now? Absolutely. If you go on uh, the hashtags on Instagram and, tw and Twitter, I guarantee you'll find some fan who just like just w said just watched the entire thing, binged watched it, so good, whatever, or bad. <laughs> like yeah. they, they think they hate it maybe, but uh, they did they did it. So um, it, it, like there's a you don't get a million views a month for a show that doesn't do hasn't released any content for nothing. It's got to be executed well. It just sits there and it's great. And yes. What was your startup budget for each of the new programs? So Lizzie, again, we didn't, the, fan, the company didn't exist. We didn't go into Lizzie Denbarries and going, oh, we're going to build this company. It's going to have multi-franchises. It's going to be a book based on a web series based on a book. No, no, no. We, we didn't do that. Uh, um, we went in going, I, we don't know if this is going to work. Let's try it. So our startup cost for Lizzie Bennett was probably 20K. And that was for 24 episodes, 12 weeks of content, plus interactive. Um, but if you watch that show, it's, it's shot very cheaply. It's, it, the production is super cheap. It's just really complicated. It's a lot of pages to write. You know, it's 120 minutes of that co content. So it's not like you know, it was like, oh, we just like, spent money. Um, one of the things I really like about our company, uh, as long as I'm running it, I'll keep it this way, is we pay everybody. We pay everybody. Our interns are paid. Uh, our writers are paid. I know WJ is in the room. Our writers are paid. <laughs> you know? Our writers are paid. Our, our writers are paid. Uh, we pay everybody. We pay our interns. We pay our PAs. We pay, we pay everybody. They're not, we're not paying them gobs of money where they're like, this is their full-time job, everybody. But we're paying them. So we make sure to build them into the budget. Um, Emma Approved was a, was a green light cross series. Uh, like Basically, they said, you're doing the whole thing. So that end series ended up being probably a little over budget. It probably ended up being close to, to 300K to do that one. But again, it's like seven hours of content mm -hmm. for 300K. That's two and a half movies, three, four movies, sorry, four and a half movies. That's wild. Um, and then Frankenstein, actually I can't tell you because PBS NDA'd me. <laughs> so, there you go. sorry. But you can actually see the progression, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you also were at a point where if Lizzie Bennett didn't work that you were like, oh yeah. They totally. were leaving the business. Totally. Yeah. Well, I was, I, was, I, was just, I was just like, that project didn't work. It's like a TV show being canceled. I was yeah. like, well, that didn't work. I tried something else. Yeah. But it totally worked. It took over uh, the, the next year and a half of my life, that franchise. And obviously, I mean, I'm amazed that you were able to sell as many DVDs as you had for a program that was available for free on YouTube and then with the follow up of a book. Oh, it's wild. You, you, know, you know, we still sell like 10 DVDs a week. <laughs> And that, that, that's six, it's a $60 DVD. It's not like a $10, like, oh, one disc, here you go. It's like a box set. And we still sell, like, you know, we, some days we sell five, you know, some weeks we sell five, but we sell, like, five to ten a week. That's wild. It's crazy. And, it's and, crazy. And then the book, what's fascinating about the book, if you think about, like, the, well, how we read books these days. Well, we, we, we love books. Everybody likes the feel of a book, but a lot of people read your books on that, yeah. the iPad. I'm pointing at his iPad. Um, if you buy the ebook experience, what's really great about the ebook experience is that it has the links to the videos in between all the, the chapter entries. And we, we actually right. const constructed it to be this way so that you'd read, it, you'd read a diary entry, you could watch the video that the diary entry leads to in the narrative and get the next diary entry, watch the next video, all the way down. So it's a whole new experience, actually. So I, can, I can honestly say the ebook experience is it's different yeah, than, the, than the book, book experience. experience. And then on top of that, there's, of course, the audiobook, right. which is another experience. Well, guess who the audiobook is read by? The Very actor. So, so if you are a super fan of the show, you get the audiobook. You actually get like a whole new show <laughs> experience because she's reading it now, because the book is written in first person. That's amazing. Last question. Going once. Georgia, I'll give it to the. Well, there's, sure? there's, there's two. We can do two, right? All right, two. All right, so we'll go ladies first and then end them with Brian. Did Nordstrom come to you or did you go to them? We went to them. We, we, so far we always go to everybody because it, it's, it's just tough. Like we're not a, a corporation, we're not an agency, we're not paramount, you know, like we have to, we have to do the hustle ourselves and like our, like if, if you ever get to see, I don't know if I can show you, but if you ever get to see our, our like, our, our uh, case studies on our clothing integrations, like they're crazy. They're crazy. We send thousands of people to the dresses and we can sell them out. 
It depends on the dress, depends on the price of the dress, you know, all these things. But we can send thousands of people to an item and they may not buy that dress. They may buy something else on, the, on that site and we, we'll, we, get, we get credited for it. But because of the show's design and Joanna looks so good in those dresses yes, that you, you, you go and you check them out and you may or may not buy them. Brian? But I'm not familiar with this space. Are people copying this, uh, this, the way you're doing these things? I mean, is this kind of a paradigm or kind of interactive? Um, you, you, if, well, if, you, if you go on YouTube now, you, you dig, you will find probably half a dozen to a dozen book adaptation YouTube series like ours. And clearly, um, uh, inspired by us, and we're happy for them. We want them to do well. Uh, so it is. There is a marketplace for this stuff. I can't say it's super lucrative <laughs> at this point because, um, as far as I know, we make the most out of it, and we don't make all that much. Uh, so, uh, but y yeah, I, I feel that's that's the thing. Like if you look at the, the ABC show, which I'm really watching very closely, even though I haven't watched the episode in a while, mm -hmm. uh, Selfie. Yeah. Okay. Selfie is based on Roman Holiday, which is based on um, son of a bitch. What's this? Uh, uh, Pygmalion, yeah, yeah. Pygmalion, right? Um, and so Pygmalion is an adaptation, so it's an adaptation, right? Um, well, Selfie is also, it's called, it's like hashtag Selfie. And she talks about like her followers all the time. The character does, like, and so when that show came out, I'm like, you, they better put this in, in experience online or I'm gonna be super mad. Well, they did, it's there. So I'm like, great. I, I can't say, you can't, I can't say that because I follow uh, this character on Instagram it leads to more views on the channel, but at least I'm, I'm, I'm more aware of it, at the very least, it's, at least it's marketing. So uh, I think there's, you're gonna see that come more and more. So what's next for you? What's beyond Frankenstein and Dave? Um, well, we're hoping, we, we, again, we, uh, the, the last slide of that was about franchises. Mm -hmm. So um, we are hoping to expand the franchises, of, expand the franchises even further. Uh, Liz Van Diaries has a second book coming out, a second one next year. I'm approved, we're designing it, um, and they're trying to play with other formats. Frankenstein, we're waiting for PBS to pick it up. Got Hopefully it. they do. But the show just like just finale, so like they, they're not in a hurry. Yeah, all right. Thank you so much. Let's thank Bernie C.